Hello, my name is Bill Johnson, and I'm going to be uh, restoring this clock. This is a, uh, a clock that belonged to the grandfather of a good friend of mine, and um, he doesn't know it, but I had his mother, through his wife, ship it to me so that I can do a restoration on it. This was a clock that his grandfather, um, who emigrated to the U.S. from Sweden around the turn of the century, uh, 1900-ish, I don't know the exact year, uh, and moved to Minnesota. And he, uh, he bought this clock early in his uh, time in the U.S. It is an Ingraham. The model is a, called a Swanee. Hang, it's a hanging model as opposed to a shelf model. You can see it has a, a base here, and it has a, a hook in the back to hang it on the wall. A lot of these clocks of a similar style have a base that's designed to sit on a shelf, but this is a hanging model. They're much less common. Um, it is uh, a style of clock that nowadays people call a gingerbread clock. Uh, in the time that this was bought, they were sold and marketed as kitchen clocks. This particular model probably cost a little under five dollars uh, around uh, 1900 or in that that span of years. Um, this one was made by the Ingraham Clock Company, one of many clock companies located in Connecticut, uh, which was the home of um, the clock industry in the U.S. at that time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be taking this clock apart and I'll explain as I go what I'm doing. Uh, this will be a series of, um, of videos as we as we work our way through the Grandberg uh, clock. So the first the first step is to start uh, disassembling and uh, unfortunately the, the, the style of clock, a kitchen clock like this, the door has a reverse painted glass. So that image on the back of the glass was painted in reverse uh, at the factory. Um, and uh, unfortunately this one is broken. So I'm going to need to uh, find uh, a replacement glass of the same style. That can be tricky because there was lots of different designs that we used at the factories. Um, and there are a few companies that sell uh, modern uh, silk screened replacements on glass. And you can even buy decals, but they look like a decal. They don't look like the original painted glass. So I'm not going to use a decal, but I'm going to try to find a replacement glass. So um, other than that, the clock is complete. Uh, the pendulum is here and uh, the winding key. It's not the proper winding key. I'll, I'll be providing the proper one. And I can tell looking at this clock, by the way, that it has been, the case has been refinished previously and um, not particularly well. So I'm going to be stripping the case and refinishing the case as well. And the dial bezel has been painted gold. It originally would have been brass plated. I'm going to strip that paint off there. The, di the dial paper I'll replace with a fresh one so it looks new. And hopefully there's enough of the brass left on the original bezel that it'll look better in its original form than with that gold paint on it. Uh, the movement looks complete to me. I'll, uh, we'll, look, we'll know more once we disassemble that as well. So let's get right into it. Um, what I do when I take these things apart is um, I save every everything, every nail, every screw, every little piece, because we're going to want to reuse those. So the first thing to do is to take the door off. Um, so that means removing these hinges here. And um, I can see that some of the screws uh, are missing and have been replaced with nails, which uh, would not have been the case in the factory. So that's another another indication that somebody else has worked on this clock. I, I would have to say, I, not knowing who worked on it, and maybe it was uh, Bert's grandfather himself or a close friend or a relative, I don't know, I don't want to be insulting anybody, but I, I don't have to admit that I'm not impressed with, uh, with what I'm seeing here from the, the, uh, the work that ref refinished it previously. So those, the screws are out. I've got to pop these nails out. Looks like they're not even hardly holding. And um, so now the door is off. And uh, normally I would be taking great care to remove that glass because the original glass is more valuable than replacement glass and we would want to save that. But since this glass is broken, uh, I'm not too concerned about that. So I'll be taking that glass out in a few more minutes. I'll also take the hinges off completely. I want to have the wood parts completely bare to strip them, but we'll just set that aside for the moment. Next thing will be to remove the hands. Uh, there's a little threaded knob. Some, some of them use a pin 
to hold the hands on. I'm just taking the hands off now. These kind of hands are called spade hands from the shape of them. Uh, and there we go with that. And then we'll take the dial off so that we can get at the movement. There's a couple of screws uh, holding the dial on. So there we can see the dial and, um, and the, the, the paint job that had been applied to it. And now when you look in here, we can see the, the movement is exposed. Um, this is an Ingraham. Ingraham um, used the same movement for a long, long time in their clocks. Some of the clock manufacturers were constantly changing or making improvements to their movements. Ingraham seems to have used basically the same movement for like 50 years. I don't know exactly, but for a long time. So this is really, um, uh, it's, there's no easy way to date the movement. Um, there's often patent dates stamped into the brass on the movement, but again, because Ingraham's patent date is pretty early on now, that won't really tell us much to help us date this clock. Um, the screws at the top are a little tough to reach. I have this, this screwdriver actually is kind of cool. It's, um, the ends of it are kind of split and as you move this up and down it separates those so they grip the screw. So it makes it easy to get into these hard to reach screws. And, uh, especially when you're reinstalling them you can, uh, you can hang on to the screw that way. So there's the last screw. You can see how it holds the screw there. And um, now we can lift the movement out. And um, right away I see that the spring is missing on the strike side, so this clock would not strike. Uh, we will be putting a new spring in there. It's very, very dark and dirty, uh, so it hasn't been cleaned in an awfully long time. Um, I'm just taking a look at um, the, uh, the, the time train. It, this, these clocks have two winding arbors that you put the key on and, and wind the clock. And the one on the right is always the time side, the one on the left is for the strike. So this train of gears is five of them in a row here on the time side. Uh, those all appear to be, um, be in operable order and the escapement is moving back. So I see nothing, nothing broken or missing uh, or damaged on the time side. And on the strike side, uh, the main problem is that we're, we're missing a spring. So this, this movement will be fairly easy to get back into uh, good working order by, from, by my initial uh, examination. We'll set that aside and then uh, there's a, something called a gong. This is what, what when the clock is striking, there's a, there's a hammer on the bottom of this movement here. That hammer strikes this, this uh, coil this, and makes the uh, distinctive sound that you hear from the, from the clock chiming. Okay, so we have that out. Um, this clock has a has a level built into the base, kind of a nice little little feature. We're going to want to pop that out. Uh, it's held in with two small nails, which are not yielding very easily here. Uh, I don't want to bend this too much. Uh, we'll get them out. Okay, there's one side. So there's the brass plate that covers the level, and then the level appears to be set in a kind of a, I don't know, a glue of some sort. So we'll leave that on, we'll leave that in there when I, when I refinish this. I don't want to try prying that out, it'll probably damage it. And then um, this, we'll take off, there's a screw that just fell. We'll take off the, the uh, clasp that holds the door. And we'll take off the hook on the back, and then I will I will uh, gently start knocking the case apart. The case is glued and held with brads, and it generally isn't too hard to get the case to come completely apart. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shut the video off for now, and uh, and come back to you when I have a, a little further to, to to explain to you. All right, welcome back. Um, I have finished taking the case apart. Um, the case is actually in pretty decent condition. Um, <clears throat> I'm finding evidence of red paint in lots of the nooks and crannies. When I separate pieces, you can see there's 
is red on all these joints here. So this clock had apparently at one time uh, been painted red. And uh, whoever refinished it last time stripped it off. But they didn't do what I've done here. They didn't disassemble the case. So there's still a lot of old finish in the corners. You can see up underneath here this goopy old old finish in lots of places. So this is this is the bracket that goes underneath the base. These parts here are the are the sides that uh, and the back goes into this. Uh, there is a little bit of broken wood up in here and I have the pieces there over here so I'll be able to glue these pieces back together uh, so that this will all uh, be one, one again. Um, the clock is an oak case but the, the factories uh, tended to do things with different woods where it wouldn't show as much. So the sides and the top of this uh, are actually not oak. They're uh, chestnut, which is a, was a less expensive wood. It was a very common wood in those days. The chestnuts are all gone. There was a blight that killed them off not long after this clock was made, and uh, there were dead chestnuts all over the eastern part of the country. But it was once one of the most common trees in the forests around here. Um, Anyway, so that's a secondary, we call it a secondary wood. So it looks, it's got a similar grain pattern as oak. You can tell it's, it's a much lighter weight wood. And like I said, it costs less. Um, here's, the, here's the base. And, and these are the most decorative parts. And you can see this, they got, you know, a nice design on. This design was not carved. It was pressed in. They, at, the, at the clock factory, they took wood like this and they steamed it for a few hours to soften it. Uh, and then they had these designs that are in here were cast into a cast iron roller. And then uh, under great pressure, this wood that had been softened with steam was fed through these rollers. And it just forced that design into the wood. And then when the wood uh, cools and dries, the design remains permanent in there. So this was a very common way of adding decorative touches. There's a lot of kitchen chairs of that era that had, the, the back of them has a press design in there. Um, so the, here is the here's the crest piece, and you can see there's a lot of nice uh, press work in that. Um, and on the back here again, you can see a lot more bits of red on there showing what it was like. Um, this this is the bottom bracket piece that uh, would go against the wall and this part is actually broken. I'm going to glue that back together. It'll be fine when it's all done uh, but I do need to glue that and I can see that there's an older break here as well and there's a piece missing so um, that's not a very noticeable piece. If it was more noticeable I might try to do something about that uh, but I think this is going to be fine and leave it more original so I will strip this glue it back together but we're not going to replace that little missing uh, counterpart to that side. And then this is the backboard. And on almost all of these clocks, the backboard is made out of pine. Again, it was a less expensive secondary wood. The part that you see below the dial, this part wasn't visible, so they didn't even waste any of the black paint. They, they painted the inside of the case black, but not the whole thing, only the part you see, uh, just to save money, I assume. Um, so I will be I will be carefully stripping this side of it, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do my usual st stripper job on this back piece because it has most of its original paper label still intact. And if I take my regular stripping regimen to this, and which will be done in the sink with a lot of water and chemicals, uh, I would be wrecking that uh, paper label. So I want to leave that paper label on there. And I see also. Um, it says up on here, written in pencil, Granberg, with a kind of a swirly end to the Y, and then something else that I, I'm not sure I can read, Senior, or I'm not sure. Uh, it looks like S. I, I'm not sure. I'll have to ask uh, the Granberg family later if they can help me decipher that. So anyway, that's the back panel. And then, of course, we've got the door. I've removed the glass. I've removed the hinges. And this is the piece with the level in it. I'm going to leave the level in there as I strip it. Uh, and on the back of this, you can see a lot of the red. This would have been uh, hidden and hard to, hard to see otherwise. So whoever stripped this shouldn't even bother to, to try to get the red paint off there. Um, so there we have it. This is, uh, this is now ready. Uh, we have the movement over here. I've got the, I've got the dial. I've got the, I've got the, the 
movement and we'll, we'll be doing that separately. I'm going to do the casework all first, which will be uh, a sequence of steps that I'll be explaining to you. And then we will work on the movement separately and then it will all come back together after I have the movement working. Um, I'll actually run the movement. This is a this is a stand that I will mount the movement in. I put it between these brackets here so I can see everything while I'm working on it and, and adjusting it. So it'll run for a week or two in the test stand um, before it goes back into the clock case. So, so the general order of operations is going to be we're going to strip all these parts. I will then uh, glue and repair those wood pieces with those broken bits of wood uh, that, have, uh, that I've, I've carefully saved. Um, and then I'll sand. I like to sand all the parts before I reassemble anything and get the first coat of finish on it while it's all apart because it's much easier to get a good finish that way. Then I will sand it and glue it all back together. And it's a combination of glue and nails that hold the case together. And then I will spray the, the final coat of finish on it uh, after it's fully assembled. And that will get then we'll set the case aside and we'll work on the movement. And that's uh that's all, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of hours worth of work in here. Um, I will pipe in periodically to show you my progress. So that's it for now. Okay, we're back. I am um, I'm applying stripper to the parts here. I have this pan and I've put a liquid stripper in the bottom of it and I've got a brush and a, all the smaller parts are in here. And what I'm doing now is one at a time, you know, just kind of I've, I've let it soak in there because if you just be patient, which is tough for me, uh, the chemicals will do all the work. And then really all I have to do is, uh, is brush out the residue and rinse it off. So this is the, this is the piece that goes right under that front shelf and had the, has the level built into it. I'm not trying to remove that. It's kind of glued in. And I'm going to uh, rinse this off now and uh, scrub it with a brush. And then we'll set these aside to dry. So I'll do this with all of the parts, and that will um, that will get me a, a set of completely stripped and ready to refinish parts of this case. And that um, that's the key to doing a nice job is that you take it all the way apart. It allows you to get the stripper, or get the old residue, get the old finish, any old paint residue, everything out of every nook and cranny, especially where the parts join together. When you leave it assembled. It's almost impossible to get the old finish out of where the joints are and, and the uh, nooks and crannies where they come together. So this piece here, I've just finished rinsing it all off. I'm just going to set that aside to dry. And I will repeat with, here's another piece. This is one of the sides on the, on the clock there. It's a, just a decorative piece. Again, I've waited. I've let the, I've let the stripper do all the work. And I'm just brushing here to gently remove everything and then I will take it over to my, my sink next door here and scrub it clean. So I just have to repeat this for about uh, I don't know a dozen or 15 parts that I disassemble on this clock and I will uh, tune back in to show you uh, the next step after I finish this stripper. So that's it for now. Um, I have uh, gotten all the case parts ready to start putting finish on. They've all been stripped. And I've done a little bit of light sanding. Let me just show you what I've got here. Uh, so there are all of the parts. This is the, uh, the crest at the top, uh, the door frame, side pieces. This is the base at the bottom. I've glued that, that piece that was broken before. And on, uh, this is uh, the right side and the top, and there was a lot of there was a lot of damage. There was a pretty serious break here, and a bunch of small pieces. I've uh, glued that all back together. There's a little piece missing, but it's just going to stay missing. I find that if I try to repair old wood with new wood, it never looks right. And this is on the top behind the crest, where you, you're not going to notice it anyway. Um, and that's actually why they used chestnut in this area. It's a secondary wood because it's not in a visible spot. So. I've got all these parts ready to finish. I want to just show you, I've, I've already uh, applied the stain. I use a, on the oak, I use a, a, a golden oak stain to give it a little more definition. So this is, this is the difference in appearance, one that's been stained and one that has not been stained. Uh, so let me just show you how I, 
how I proceed. And um, so I tend to, you know, I'm wearing this uh, this old apron to keep the uh, stain mostly on the wood and not on me. And I've got a, a glove on on the hand that I'm using the material. Here's the can of stain. I'll take the brush here. You don't need very much. I'm just applying small amounts. Um, you end up wiping off all the excess anyway, so the idea isn't to drown it in stain, it's just to get enough on there to soak into the wood. Um, now, let me just tell you that when I'm applying finish on a clock, um, I'm doing a, a more thorough job than they did at the factory. In the factory, it, it was a very, very competitive industry. There were a lot of competing clock makers. Uh, the catalog retailers, I'm sure, just like Amazon and Walmart today, put a lot of pressure on the suppliers to keep the cost down. So the factories didn't didn't even put finish on the back of the clocks. And I think I showed you that that back panel that is inside the clock the, that the movement mounts to that's painted black, they only painted it black from the dial down. They didn't even waste paint on the upper part that's behind the dial. They figured if nobody's going to see it, we're not going to put any paint there. So I've just put stain on this piece, um, and now I take a rag and I just wipe off the excess. And um, I'm careful not to put stain on the parts where I've got to glue it. Um, after the stain dries, it really shouldn't compromise the glue joint, but I'd rather have just bare wood to bare wood where I'm, where I'm gluing things. All right, so there is a piece uh, ready to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that to all these other pieces. And um, next time I come back on the video here, uh, we'll be starting to um, put finish uh, on all these pieces. I, I put a single coat of sanding sealer on them because it's a lot easier when they're apart. And then I will do some sub-assembling work. So we'll, we'll assemble all of the parts to the, to the sides here. These, um, these pieces attach like this to the side with nails and glue. So we will, we will do some sub-assembly work like that and then um, uh, apply a next coat of finish and then I'll completely assemble it and then we'll spray it with the final coat. So making good progress on the case. I think it's going to look very very nice. There was very actually not a lot of damage on this one which is nice to see. <clears throat> the one part that I <clears throat> noticed after I got it apart is this is the the base underneath uh, the shelf so this is the very bottom of the clock. And this piece here had a crack in it that I fixed. But I also noticed earlier that it was missing a piece that it broke off. The, the counterpart to here is missing on this side. But also there is breaks with missing pieces over here and over here as well. And I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, I could probably trim that off a little cleaner, glue on a new piece of wood, and cut that detail in but I think it's better to in this case it's not very noticeable and I think that's part of the part of the charm of this clock it's been in one family its whole life um, it may have fallen off the wall or something I don't know how those those breaks occur but that's part of its life in the Granberg family and I so I just think it's better to uh, to leave that as is rather than for me to try to make it perfect I think in this case uh, it's going to look fine, and that's just part of what makes it the Grandberg family clock. So, I'll be back later. Thanks. I've let the uh, stain dry overnight, uh, so it's been about 24 hours. So, uh, it's important to let things dry between coats. I tend to be a little impatient, but uh, I've learned that you get better results if you, if you wait a little bit and not rush this process. So. I'm going to apply, you can see all the parts here of the uh, of the case, except for the back that I have on the bench over there. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to do the back separately. I'm just going to spray paint the, the uh, black finish on there. And, um, oops, and that will uh, <coughs> go on the clock after the case is all fully assembled and, and sprayed. So what I'm going to be doing here is just using this sanding sealer. Um, I do, uh, so I've, I've, Strip the parts. I've sanded the parts lightly. I don't do a lot of sanding of the bare wood because I don't want to lose the details in there. I've stained them and now I'm going to put this coat of sanding sealer on, on all the parts. And this is, uh, this is kind of the base of the finish. And uh, it's called sanding sealer because you end up sanding a lot of it back off. But it fills all the, all the nooks and crannies in the wood so you get a much smoother finish. 
And, um, you know, if you go, if you try to rush right to the finished coat too quickly, you don't get a really nice result. And, of course, I'm kind of fussy about this stuff. I want it to look great. So I always start with a coat of sanding sealer. And, um, <clears throat> and it's much easier to sand these parts when the sanding sealer is dry because they're all apart. Uh, I don't, I'm not bumping it up against the joints of the other pieces and so forth, so it's going to be very easy to get these smooth. And then I can start doing some assembly of a few of the sections, a little, little bit of sub-assemblies. Like, this is a side piece, and, um, you know, it'll have one of these attached to it. So it's much easier to, to have them sanded first. <clears throat> Let me also explain that... Um, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I'm using solvent-based finishes. They're getting harder and harder to buy. Um, they're being kind of phased out in favor of, of uh, water-based finishes, which don't release uh, any vapors into the atmosphere. And, um, you know, I'm certainly sympathetic to the atmosphere, um, but I don't really trust the, the modern water-based finishes. And they, they have a couple of properties I don't like. They dry very, very quickly, and so when you when you're applying finish, something called maintaining a wet edge, uh, so that the strokes blend as you as you're working, it's much harder to do with the water finishes. And uh, I just I just I don't know. They don't sand as well. There's a bunch of bunch of things that, in my mind, make them a second secondary choice to what I'm. I know I can get really good results with the methods I'm using with solvent based finishes. So. As long as I can still get them, I will continue to use uh, solvent-based finishes for my work. <clears throat> I also want to comment a little bit about, you know, the difference between restoration and conservation. So, I'm actually using, in a lot of cases, slightly different materials than would have been used when this clock was made. They, they didn't have the same like adhesives, the uh, finishes that they used were shellac generally, um, and uh, so I'm not I'm not trying to make it exactly like it was from the factory because uh, I can use better materials today that will give it a, a look very very close to its original condition um, without being a, str a strict uh, adherent to the way it was built. Now if this was a museum and we were trying to conserve historic pieces. That's the work of a, of a conservator, as it's called. And a conservator would be using exactly the same methods, the same materials, uh, everything to match the original. And that's not, I mean, this is going in a home. It's not a, not a museum piece. I see no reason to mimic the original materials down to the, down to the last uh, detail like that. And even if I did, um, it probably wouldn't, you know, the clock would not run as well. Like the lubricants that I'm going to be able to use on the movement are, are synthetic oils that are far, far better than the natural oils that used to be used uh, to lubricate a clock movement. And those oils, they gum up over time, you know, they get thicker and, uh, and they slow the clock down and they attract a lot of dust and dirt as they get gummy. And the modern... Um, Synthetic oils don't do that, so I'm making a lot of a lot of substitutions as I go. My my intent here is to make it look uh, as close as possible to the way it would have looked when it was new, but to perform at the same level or better because I can substitute better materials along the way, and so that's what I'm doing. Yes, I just wanted to you know clarify that I'm not doing a, a conservation type restoration. I'm doing a, a, I don't know what the right term for it would be, but it's a restoration that will bring the clock back into a long life of service. I expect this clock will easily last another hundred years. It's, it's 107 years old now, um, and, uh, and it'll definitely go at least that much longer after this restoration. Um, I also want to tell you that I, um, I did a little online research uh, in between steps here, and, uh, and I found a website that indicated that the E. Ingraham Clock Company you know, was in the habit of stamping 
a month and year code on the movements, which I had not previously been aware of. And I went back to the movement, and I actually ran it through, I haven't disassembled it yet, but I just ran it through the, the cleaner as it, you know, fully assembled, just so I could get a, a better look at the plates. And I was able to find um, a month and year stamped into the movement. It was manufactured in December of 1914. So we now know that the age of this clock, um, that's when it was being made at the factory. So it seems very likely to me that it was not in the hands of uh, the Granberg family until sometime in 1915. Um, and <clears throat> we don't know uh, how the clock was purchased, whether it was purchased from a local shop or a door-to-door -door salesman. My hunch is that it was probably purchased out of a catalog. Um, most of these clocks, uh, that's how they were purchased. You know, the whole idea of catalog shopping was pioneered by Sears Roebuck and, and Montgomery Ward and aided and abetted by the fact that we had railroads that could transport these goods anywhere across the country and that even the territories at that time of the, of the U.S. So uh, all sorts of consumer goods um, were, were available through these catalogs. And if you look at reprints of the old Sears and Montgomery Ward's catalogs, they had pages and pages of clocks in the catalogs. And um, I now know that this is a 1915 purchase, in all likelihood, from a December 1914 manufactured clock. Uh, I found my cousin has uh, some reprints of some of these things, and he has a, a reprint of a 1907 catalog. And this clock is listed in it, um, and it cost $4.75 in, in 1907. It probably did not cost much more in 1914 or 15, uh, so under $5 uh, for a clock like this. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of a little bit of interesting history. Um, all right, I'm going to continue. This will probably be boring to watch me applying finish to all of these parts here, but you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to let these dry at least at least for a full 24 hours, uh, and then I will be able to sand them and um, <clears throat> start doing a little bit of assembly on the case, and then move to a more final finish coat. <clears throat> so I'll be checking back with you then. Thank you. All right, so now we've got all the case parts have got their first coat of finish on them. Well, they've, stained, they've been stripped, stained, and a coat of sanding sealer. I've, I've sanded the sanding sealer, and now I'm starting to assemble the case. So this is the fun part. Now it's starting to come back together and look like a clock again. So what I've done here is like, this is the, this is the base section that goes uh, underneath the clock. Uh, it's got that built-in level here. And it consists of four pieces. This is the, the base of the clock case itself. We've got this uh, back panel. There's a brace in the middle and then the, the piece on the front. And I've, I've uh, glued and nailed that back together. I've actually, uh, when I took the case apart, I saved all the nails. So I've got them sorted by size. So these are the exact nails that came out of the case. I'm able to reuse the old nails in their original holes. So it makes it easy to line up the parts when you do it that way. And it's correct. I'm, I'm putting the clock back together the way it was intended to be put back together. So it's kind of nice whenever I can reuse the old pieces like that. So that's the base. That's a sub-assembly. <clears throat> uh, the door I didn't have to take apart. It, it's actually assembled. It's glued together on all these corners with, uh, with something called a spline. Uh, and those are all in really good shape. This door was not loose. Oftentimes the, the doors are coming apart and they have to be re-glued and repaired. But this one was great. Um, of course, here's the crest. This is the nice piece at the top of the clock. Um, when it was when it was refinished years ago, um, whoever did that work was a little aggressive in the sanding. They actually sanded out some of the raised detail in the in the uh, press work, which is a little bit unfortunate. So I was very careful not to do much sanding up here. I didn't want I want to preserve as much of the detail in this as we can. Uh, I think it looks quite nice, but. Um, it's just a little flattened across the top, which is, uh, well, it is what it is. And then this is the little brace that's going to go in the back here to keep this upright. 
So I, the next thing I'm going to assemble, just to show you what I'm doing here, is these are the sides and the top. I've already glued and nailed these decorative pieces onto the sides of the case. And I have to re-glue the miters that join the top to the sides here. And to make that possible, I've actually put the back of the clock back on with the original nails in the original hole. So everything's in the proper position. And then because it's in the proper position, everything will line up and I can glue and clamp this piece onto the top, which is what I'm going to do now. And um, so I've actually, oops, i got to grab these. These are special miter clamps. If you look closely, they, you, can, you can squeeze them and they're, they're kind of spring-loaded. they got little points. And these will grip and hold the miter when I glue it. So let's go ahead and do that. Everything is lined up, so I'm just going to apply glue. I'm using uh, yellow woodworker's glue. It's an aliphatic resin for you chemists out there. Uh, it's a very good adhesive. This is better than the hide glue that was used uh, when the clock was manufactured. They were making glue in those days out of animal hides. And um, the nice part about the hide glues is that they're reversible. You can, if you soak them in water, you can get them apart. Um, but the, uh, the strength of the high glue is relatively low compared to what I'm using here. So I'll just clamp this here. And we'll let that dry overnight. And then um, I will attach this part to the base. And that will be basically the assembled clock case. Uh, just lining up the joints here correctly. That looks very good. Okay, it's all in place. I'll take a sponge here, a damp sponge, or just uh, add any, any of the glue that's squeezed out. We'll get it now while it's wet. It's a lot easier. And, uh, and there we have it. So that's our, that's our assembled case, most of the way assembled anyway. And um, you know, when we attach the base underneath here, like so, that'll be after this dries. And then the crest can be applied, which goes on here. And that'll basically be it. Then we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll spray some finish and then the case will be done. Uh, so making good progress. I'm very happy with uh, the way it's coming out. Uh, and I'm very happy with the, the original details that are holding up very nicely here. So this is really going to be a pretty clock. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to getting some final finish on it. I also am very happy with the report that this reverse painted glass that is broken on this one, I was looking around online and one of the companies that I buy clock parts from, Merritt's Antiques in uh, Douglasville, Pennsylvania, uh, they have some reproduction glasses. They're actually stenciled uh, on here now. Actually silk screen, not stenciled. Um, and they have this exact pattern. Uh, so I'm going to be able to order from Merritt's a new glass with a silk screened uh, reverse painting on here that is identical to this one. So it will look exactly right. I'm really happy about that. It's only 14 bucks for the, for the glass. So uh, I'm going to be ordering a bunch of parts. I'm going to be ordering the glass. And I, I'll wait to place my order until I have the movement apart because I know I'm going to need at least one spring. And after I get it completely apart, there may be a, a, a two or three other small parts that I need. So I'll wait and I'll make one order to Merritt's. And then we'll have everything we need to get this clock all done. So look forward to coming back and showing you some more progress. Thank you. Well, we're finally ready to do the final finish on this. I have the case all back together. You can see it's all glued and it's been, all the parts have an initial coat of finish on them. Um, and I have since then uh, assembled it with its old nails. I'm going to be spraying on a coat, uh, one on the front, one on the back, and then I'll flip it over and do a, a second coat on the face pieces. This is the door frame we'll be spraying as well. And the back panel, which I spray painted black and then I just lightly sanded, I'll spray that with the urethane as well. 
but the back of this that has that original label, I'm not going to touch at all. It's going to have uh, what's left of the original finish still on the back. So we're ready to go. I've got my, my aerosol here. I've masked off that little level that's in the base there so we don't get urethane on that. And I'm just going to start uh, spraying. I like, to, I like to work my way around the edges, get all these, these nice details, get some finish into those. And then I will, um, I will spray the, the main surface. Um, so this will take, uh, oh, 10 or 15 minutes. And this will dry for a few hours, and then I'll come back, flip it over, do the back, lightly sand the front, and, and put a final coat on. So next time you see this, the case is going to be completely done and ready for the movement and glass to be put back in it and, and reassembled. And then we're going to work on the movement. See you then. Okay, we are ready to disassemble this movement. I have it here uh, on the bench. Uh, in order to disassemble it, the first thing we have to do is let the power down. This spring here, there's only one spring remaining. The other spring for the strike side was broken and already removed. But we have to let the spring, uh, let the power down out of the spring. Otherwise, if I separate this movement with this with the spring wound up like this, we'll get an explosion of parts, probably damage some things, and I could even get hurt. So first thing we're going to do is let the power down. I'm using something called a bench key, which these are the winding arbors. This is where you would wind the clock with the key. So the key would go on here to, to wind up the time side. But I'm going to use this bench key, which I can let slip through my fingers to let the power down. So I'm, I'm basically, there's a little ratchet, called, it's called a pawl, a ratchet pawl, and I'm pulling out that ratchet pawl, and now I can with my hand just slowly let the power out and there we go and now the that spring has been been released and um, now it's safe for me to take this movement apart um, if I was going to be reusing that spring I probably would have put a, a, a what they call a confine on there but since I'm going to be replacing it I don't worry about that so there are the way the movement is assembled is there's a brass plate on the front, and there's a brass plate on the back. And all of the, the gears, we call them wheels in the clock train, all the wheels are in between the plates. And so what we do is we separate the plates. And there are these nuts holding the plates together. I'm also going to take off, this is called the verge and the pallets for the suspension and the... Um, suspension as a part of the escapement. I set those aside and now I'm going to just take these nuts off of here. There's five of them total and then we will be able to separate the plates and then all the parts are just going to fall right out and um, I will then be able to run everything through the parts cleaner Oops. and um, we'll polish up the pivots. I'm going to have to put some some new bushings in here here we go. Let's just take this thing right apart. So there's the top plate comes off, the escape gear, and then we'll just lift out all these other gears. And this is now a completely disassembled clock movement. It looks very daunting to be able to put this all back together, but it's actually not that bad after you've done it a few times. So I had already, while this movement was still fully assembled, I ran it through the cleaner kind of quickly to get the worst of the dirt off it so it wouldn't be so bad when I'm, when I'm disassembling it now. I'll just take this spring off of here. There we go. So there's the spring removed. And so this is it. This is all apart. Um, I'm going to be looking very carefully at these plates uh, to see which bushings I need to replace, or excuse me, which bushings I need to put in it. I already looked earlier, and um, on wheels uh, three and four on the time side, there's definitely going to need bushings. But I can, I will do that with by test fitting. And um, the next step I'm actually going to do is to carefully inspect all of these. You would call this a gear in the clock trade. We call it a wheel. It consists of the shaft, which is an arbor, and on the ends of it, the part that engages in the plate, we call a pivot. 
and the pivots fit very nicely the holes that are bored in the plate and that is where the friction occurs that's where we're going to put a tiny bit of clock oil when we put it back together the outer part of the gear we call the wheel and then this inner part which is where the next wheel engages on it um, is called a pinion and so if we look closely uh, it's not really auto focusing but there's a there's a pinion here at the center of the shaft and um, so all of these need to be cleaned. I'm going to polish the ends here, these pivots. I'm going to polish those on a polishing wheel, a buffing wheel. And then we'll be able to put it back together. So now it's a matter of clean up the parts. The next thing I'm going to show you when I'm ready is, uh, is installing the bushings where the, where the plate is worn in a few places. So I'll check back with you when I'm ready to do that. Thank you. I thought I'd uh, take a minute before I restore the movement to explain to you how the clock actually works. Now I've taken the, the movement here and I've assembled just the, the wheels on the time side here. So on an American 8 day clock the right side is, the, is a set of gears we call the time train and on the left side is the strike train and I, we're not going to worry about the strike right now. I just want to explain how the time works. So everything starts here at this this first wheel. This is the wheel that would have a spring on it. The spring looks like this. It's a piece of uh, spring steel that's eight feet long, three quarters of an inch wide, and it gets wound tightly around the arbor of this first wheel. And when you wind the clock, what you're doing is you're putting the key on here and you're turning this to wind that spring up as tight as it can go around the axle. And then over the course of the eight days, this wheel is going to rotate one complete revolution a day. So in a week it will make seven full revolutions. So at the end of the week when you wind it, if you wind your clocks the same time of day on the same day of the week, and for me it's I wind all my clocks on Sunday morning, when you wind this, each turn of the key is a half of a revolution on that winding up the, the uh, spring. So since it's making seven full revolutions, it's 14 half revolutions with the key. So on, on Sunday morning when I wind the clocks, they all go 14 times to get fully wound. All right, you can see that I've put the hands on here and I'm gonna turn the, whoops, let's go the right direction here, yeah. So I'm gonna turn the, the, the base wheel and what you can see is each gear in the train is amplifying the revolutions of the next one up. So this one makes one revolution a day the next one up makes multiple revolutions a day. Wheel number three has many more multiples of that. By the time we get to this last wheel, which is called the escape wheel, that's making thousands of revolutions a day. And because of the, the geometry of the gears, each time we multiply the, the number of revolutions, we correspondingly reduce the amount of power that gets transmitted. So, the spring is quite strong and when you wind it you're overcoming a lot of uh, power in that spring to wind it up. But as the power unwinds and goes through this gear train, by the time we get to the last wheel, wheel number five, there's very little power. You can, you can stop this clock easily with your finger uh, at wheel five, whereas down at the bottom here is actually quite dangerous. If this starts to freewheel, get out of the way because the spring is going to unload quickly and uh, release a lot of power and you can't stop it. So there's actually a little bit of danger when you're working with, this, with the clock spring. But, so all of this power does two things. One is it drives the hands and the gearing on the hands has been figured out such that um, one full revolution of this first wheel is going to result in two revolutions, two complete revolutions of the hour hand. It's a 12 hour measurement and um, and so forth. So really all we're doing with the gear train is we're, we are reducing and reducing the power through through speeding up the wheels till we get to this last wheel. And what happens at that last wheel is this little piece goes on here and what it does is it prevents the escape wheel from advancing very far. It only allows it to advance a half a tooth on a tick and another half on the talk. So I'm going to put this on here, and maybe you'll see what I mean. All right, so I've got the uh, 
I've got the escapement on there. And they call it an escapement because the power is actually escaping from the clock at this point. And so as we as the power is going through the clock, this escape wheel, as we go back and forth, is advancing one tooth at a time. And as it advances, as it comes off the tooth, there's a little angle on this, it's called a pallet. And that little angle generates a tiny little push. And that push is what pushes against the pendulum. So the pendulum is hanging here on the clock. Let me hold this a little closer so you can see what I'm talking about. I'll put the suspension on here. So it's, a, it's really quite clever. So we will put this on here and I'll hang the pendulum. Kitchen clocks like this generally have a, about a nine inch drop on the pendulum. And so as the pendulum is going back and forth, each tick and talk, the escape wheel is generating a tiny little push here, which pushes against this, what they call the suspension, the thing that's suspending the pendulum. And it gives it, they call it an impulse, and that little, that tiny little bit of power pushing on the edge of this suspension is what keeps the pendulum swinging. And the reason a clock works is that a pendulum has a unique property that Galileo discovered in 1502. And what Galileo discovered is a pendulum's period, that is the length of time it takes to make a pass out and back, that's called the period of a pendulum. And the period of a pendulum does not depend on the mass or the weight of the pendulum bob. It depends only on the length of the pendulum. That's really amazing. So what's happening here, we're putting a little push to keep this pendulum moving, but the pendulum is going to move at the speed dictated by its length. And it wouldn't matter how heavy the pendulum bob is on here, it's always going to make the same period um, based on its length. And so to adjust the clock, there's a screw on the bottom of the pendulum here. This, the bottom of the pendulum rod, I'm going to take this off, the bottom of the pendulum rod is threaded. And there's a nut here, and what you're doing when you move the nut up is you're shortening the pendulum, which will shorten the period. In other words, it'll, it'll go faster. And when you move the nut out, the pendulum becomes longer, and the clock will run slower. So that's how we regulate the clock. So it's really amazing. And it, if you don't believe me, next time you go to the playground, watch the kids on the swing. And if you want to bring a stopwatch with you or use the app on your phone, time the length of time of a period on the swing set and, and check it against however many kids get on there. It won't matter how big the kid is. It could be a little small child or an adult. That swing is going to go the same period no matter who is on it because it's dictated by the length of the chains hanging from the, from the swing set. And that's kind of a mind blower, but you, you check it out next time you're at a playground and you'll, you'll prove it for yourself. And that's really how the clock works. So we've got a source of power that's running through the gear train and driving the hands. And the speed of those gears unwinding is dictated by how f fast this pendulum is moving. And that's dictated purely by its length, which we can adjust with a screw. So we got a little bit of power being used to keep the pendulum going. And the pendulum is unvarying in its speed. And that's how the clock actually works. So I'm going to stop there. Okay, the next thing I need to do in servicing this clock is that it has some wear in it. Now, each of these wheels in the clock, here's what a, when I talk about a clock wheel, this is, this is a clock wheel. It's, you would call it a gear, but it's on a steel shaft and the ends of that steel shaft have been turned down to a pretty small diameter and that's called the pivot. And the pivots spin in holes in, this, in the brass plates. There's a front plate and a back plate separated by these steel posts. And so each wheel is spinning on its pivots in holes in the brass plate. And what I've done here is I've looked carefully at this clock and I've marked there are, on this one, there are one, two, three, four of the holes in the plate have worn into an egg shape. They're way too big now. And so the wheels actually have a lot of play in them. And that's not good because it means that the gears are not intersected. What we call the mesh of the gears is no longer correct. And when they're out of mesh like that, it can slow the clock down. So I'm going to take this back apart and we're actually going to carefully drill out 
the old holes. They're called, and we're going to put in a bushing, which is a new piece of brass that's the correct size for the pivots. And that will allow us to uh, remove all the wear from this clock and make it good as new. So even though this clock is, you know, over 100 years old and it's got some significant wear on it, which means it actually ran for quite a, quite a while, which is, I like, I like knowing that. Sometimes these clocks haven't run that long, and that's kind of sad. I, I think a clock is made to run, and I like to see them run. So we're going to get uh, all of the wear removed on this, so it's going to run as well as it ran when it came out of the Ingraham factory. So I'll take this apart, and the next thing I'm going to show you is how we ream it out uh, or drill those holes um, with a bushing machine that I have here behind me that's going to uh, make those precision holes, and we'll push these new bushings in. Okay, this is my bushing tool. What this is is a, a precision jig that holds the plate in place and has uh, cutters that mount on this shaft that I'm going to turn with my hand here to ream out or do a precision hole that that bushing can go in. And so the first thing I've done is I've, I've put a centering bit in here and I've, I've found the center of the old hole. And then I've clamped the plate with these holders so that the plate can't shift around uh, because the bit is going to wander into the egg-shaped part of the hole and I want to be back at the original center point. So I've found that center point. Now I'm going to take that centering piece out and put in the reamer, and this is a, it's a little cutter um, that mounts in here. It's a little tight, there we go. And now as I come down here into the brass, it's going to cut that brass into the diameter of the bushings. And the bushings are made by, there's only really two companies that make clock bushings. and. Uh, so the sizes have all been standardized based on those two companies. And the, the size bushings I use come from a company called KMW. So I have uh, KMW size reamers. So now I've, I've made that precision hole right here. And I'm going to go press in a, a tiny brass bushing that's got the right size opening in it for the pivot. And that'll, that will uh, restore this plate to like new condition. And I'm going to repeat that. I've got... A total of six bushings going into this clock. Four on the front plate and two on the back plate. And so then the time train will have no wear in it and it will run very smoothly. The strike side, as is typical on these, has less wear. There's less rotations in the in the strike side of the clock and um, they, they tend to not wear as badly as the time side because of course it's running hour after hour after hour. So um, that's it. I will, uh, I will show you. The next step I'm going to show you is after I get all the bushings in, we'll, we'll reassemble the, uh, the movement. That's a tricky part. That's the fun part for me, but uh, it's, it's also the, can be the most frustrating. So I'll see you then. Okay. <clears throat> we're at the, uh, the trickiest part of the process here. This is where we're going to reassemble the movement. And this is actually quite tricky, and this is the part that... Uh, generally gives clockmakers the most grief. Uh, and I've done a few things that you haven't seen. Um, for example, all of the pivots, that's the end of these, every one of these wheels is on a steel shaft, and the end of it where it goes through the hole in the plate. Remember I put bushings in the plate where they were worn out, but the part that goes in those holes is called the pivot. And those need to be nice and smooth. And what I did is I polished them on a buffing wheel. It's basically a a cloth wheel that you mount in a, in a grinder, spins at high speed, and you charge it with a mild abrasive. It's how jewelers polish things. And I've polished the ends of all the pivots, so they're nice and smooth. And my replacement bushings are all in here. And now what I've done is, on the bottom plate, I have installed all of the wheels and the levers for the strike. And it looks very tricky, and actually it is. If you, after you do this for a while, you kind of learn... Uh, how they go together, and, and it's not not too bad. There's only one way it can go together, so it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Once you once you've got everything in the right place, it'll work. But the hard part is, I have all the wheels mounted on one plate, and I have to get this other plate on there and line up every pivot so that it's, everything is captured between the two plates and in their holes. And here we go. So I'm going to start over the winding shafts. Um, and uh, I get the minute shaft, 
and the winding shafts. Okay, so that's the basic. I've got started. Now the way I work this, everybody's got their own little method here. I start at the bottom and I'll, I'll get a nut on this stud to hold it. And then I'll go over to this stud and line that up and put one of the nuts on there. And then basically what I'm going to be doing is working my way up through, pushing things into position, and you get this little satisfying snap when things line up. And when that happens, uh, everything is good. Now I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can work a little more easily here, because I have to pick this up and move it around. And what I'm doing is I'm looking through the side here to find where things are hung up. And then I will line up those with their corresponding hole, and then I can work my way down the plate. And um, that's how we do it. So wheel number two on the time side, I find its hole, and the plate drops a little bit further, and I find number three, and so forth. I'll get the post lined up. And I could probably drop a nut on here now to hold this together. Because once I've got things in the holes, I don't want them to fall back out. Um, so I'm going to keep working my way around here. I've got to get the um, escape wheel into its hole. And wheel number four. It's going to be a little tricky. I'm going to loosen this nut and get wheel four in there. Okay, so there goes number four. And let's get the escape wheel in there. And I'm going to work my way down to here. This is starting to snap, which is great. That means we're getting close. Get these back into position, and this one in position. Okay, I'm going to put another nut on here. Getting closer. I've got a wheel that's got to go over here. We're very close now. There it is. Okay, so it just dropped together. We get that satisfying snap that I always love to hear. And I'll put that last nut on there. And that means that all of the wheels are in the train are now installed. And um, I just need to look. Oops, I see one, one nut quite seated. I gotta get I gotta lift this corner and get shaft number four in. Um, that's not too bad. Sometimes it takes me several attempts before I get it together. Okay, there it is. All right, so now we're all together. And now from here on out, it's a matter of uh, making a bunch of adjustments and getting the mesh correct on the strike. And that's just some trial and error work that won't be very exciting to watch on video. So the next time I come back, we should have this movement ready to start running and see if see how she goes. So I'll check in with you then. Okay, I've got the movement assembled. I'm ready to oil it and put it on the test stand. And to do that, I use some magnification. So I've got this lovely hat here. I'm using a needle oiler. And the, the trick with oiling a clock is to use the tiniest amount. Most people put too much oil when they oil the clock. So I'm just getting the tiniest amount on each pivot because if there's any extra oil, what it does is it attracts dust and dirt. And that's the, that's the real enemy of a clock is dirt. And so I'm just touching the tiniest amount of oil on each pivot. And, um, and then we're going to have this thing ready to put on the test stand and run it. Very excited about that. This clock probably hasn't run in, I don't know, 20, 30 years, 40 years. And it's ready to uh, come back to life. And that is always an exciting thing for me. And uh, I've got to oil this piece here on the escapement. 
Okay. All right. And we're going to turn it over and oil the back side. Just oiling where every pivot where it comes through the plate needs a touch of oil. All right, that is it. We're all lubed. I can take my uh, magnifier off. And I've got a test stand here, which I can hold the movement in. The beauty of the test stand is I can see everything. If I put it in back in the clock case, it'll run there too, but I can't, if I have to make any adjustments or do anything, I can't see what I'm doing. So now I've got it in the test stand. I've put the hands on it, and I'm going to hang the pendulum. And look at that. She's running. <laughs> I love it. All right. Um, and it's actually in beat too, which is unusual. Usually I got to adjust the verge here to get to even out the ticks and the talks. But that sounds great. I've got it wound up and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to advance it to the correct time. Okay, that just struck six o'clock, so I'm going to move the hour hand to, this, to here. And I'm going to go, it's actually 9.30 right now, p.m. So I'm going to get this to 9.30, and I'll come back tomorrow, and hopefully um, it'll be within range. It'll be pretty close. Um, first, the first test will be, will it run overnight? Um, and I'm pretty confident it will. If it won't, it's going to need some, it means there's something binding somewhere, something rubbing, um, and I'll need to figure out what that is. But if it runs overnight um, and it's pretty close to being regulated, we're in the home stretch and it'll just be a few final adjustments, and then we can put this back in the case. That's a really exciting thing. All right. Well, I'm in the final finishing touches stage here and I wanted to show you what I'm doing. First thing I want to show you is that I have the new uh, door glass in. I'm going to hold that close so you can see the pattern in it. Here is the original and um, it's, a, it's a really good match. It's uh, virtually identical to the original pattern that was in there. So I'm very very happy about that. There was one tricky piece to that and that is, they ship you this glass in an oversized pane uh, with a square top. And so it had to be cut down in size. And I've cut plenty of glass. It's not that hard. You use a special tool, you use a straight edge, and you score it, and then you snap it. That's all well and good. Uh, but I had to remove a very small amount from the edge, like a quarter of an inch from the edge on both sides and on the bottom. And it's, it's really impossible to do the standard score and snap method with it for a tiny edge like that. So um, I did what everybody does nowadays. I went on to YouTube and searched and sure enough there is a technique for doing that where you actually tap lightly with a, uh, the, the end of the um, tool that you use to score the glass has a little ball hammer on the end of it and you hold that right along the edge and you tap and it, you apply a little bit of pressure as you're tapping and you work your way along and sure enough it worked great and I was able to able to remove uh, the edges on both sides of that glass. So the, the door has, has been reassembled. There's actually uh, little strips of wood. The original ones were all split, so I cut some fresh ones. And, uh, and then there's little tacks that hold that in, so that, that, that is back to the way it should be. So that's ready to reinstall. I have the, the hinges back on here. I've polished them up. And um, the other thing I'm doing is, um, this is the original dial pan. It's pressed steel. It originally had a, a plating of brass on there. That's long gone. This was actually quite rusty. I, uh, I cleaned it up as best I could, and I tried painting it, but I'm not happy with that. The paint won't last. It doesn't look... You can never paint it and have it look as good as brass. Uh, so I ordered a new dial pan. The new dial pan is actually better quality than the original. This was cheap stamped steel. The new one is solid brass. It's not very expensive. Like, $18 or something like that. Um, and so it's actually going to have a nicer dial pan than when it came out of the factory. And not, 
identical in that this one had a raised ridge in the middle and you, and you cut the dial in two sections so there was a little brass ring that showed on the dial. Uh, this one won't have that, but it's a it's a nicer quality bezel and it's going to be shiny and nice. So I've, um, when you get it, the holes aren't drilled. I had to uh, use this as a template to get the holes in exactly the right place, drill them out, and then I polished it up uh, with some brass polish and sprayed it with clear lacquer so it'll stay shiny. And then what I've got here is, this is the dial paper. This just It's just a, kind of a heavy, like an oak tag paper with the uh, with the dial pattern printed on it. I'm going to hold that close so you can see. It's got the Roman numerals and along the bottom it says, you know, manufactured by the E. Ingraham Company, Bristol, Connecticut, USA, which is what the originals had. And it says Ingraham in the Ingraham script, just like the original. So I know that the dial pan is five inches. I took a compass like this and very nicely they've marked the center point on the dial pan. So I've drawn a, a, a pencil circle and then it's just a matter of uh, old-fashioned scissor skills like you did in kindergarten, except much more carefully. So I'm cutting out the circle as accurately as I can. And once I have this all cut out, um, it's just, I have a, a spray adhesive I use where I spray the adhesive on the back of this. And then I press it on here. you got to be careful. You have one chance if you stick it on and you don't like it. It's too late. Um, so what I do is I, I make some witness marks on it. So I've already carefully marked out uh, things here and I've put, a, I've put a mark at the top at the 12 o'clock point so that when I position the dial what I'll do is I'll, I'll start at the top get the 12 o'clock mark and I'll hold it up to the light and then drop it into the and, uh, and hopefully get it right. I've done quite a few of these and I've had very good luck with it. Once it's all glued on I take an X-Acto knife and I cut out the circles and then there are little brass they call them escutcheons. These are trim rings that go over the holes so that it looks nice. And then the dial will be ready to reinstall. And um, and then the clock will, will basically be done. I, I am, I have to admit, I, I uh, backtracked a little bit. I had it running on the test stand. It's been running great and actually keeping very good time. I've been very happy with the whole thing. But in watching it, I can see that one of the wheels on the strike side, the what they call the third wheel, um, needed a bushing. And so I've taken the, the movement back apart and I just installed a new bushing and I have the parts back in the ultrasonic cleaner just to clean it up one more time. I'll reassemble it, lube it again, and, and um, it should be fine. Um, I didn't want to ship the clock back uh, with that one wheel not being really uh, nice and true. Uh, it probably would run for another 50 years before it would give you any trouble like that, but I'm doing a top-to-bottom rebuild, so I thought I'll, I'll throw that one more bushing in there. So I think that brings the total up to seven or eight bushings I put in this clock. So that's uh, basically the story of this clock. Uh, when you see me come back again, it's going to be so I can show off the, the, the fully assembled, uh, beautifully restored clock uh, ready to give back to Bert Grandberg. So uh, until then, I'll see you later. Well, there it is. It's done. I'm, I'm really happy that this clock is finished. That's ready to give back to the Grandbergs. I want to just explain a couple of things quickly uh, to close this out. Uh, first of all, um, this clock needs to be wound once a week. You do that with this key. I've provided the correct key. It's an Ingraham patent key. You put it in and turn these until they won't turn anymore. And it's going to be at the end of a week, 14 half turns on the time. And this is the strike. You wind that up as well. Um, I store the key right in the clock. Um, if the clock stops for any reason, once it's wound, you simply give the pendulum a push and then it'll get going again. Uh, the tricky thing is setting the time. Um, you generally want to go forward with the time. When you move the hands, you, you don't move the hour hand, you move the minute hand. And of course it's geared to the hour hand, so the hour hand will move too. Um, and if you, when you get to the hour, you have to stop and wait while it counts off the chime. Of course I'm at 11, so this is going to be kind of tedious here. Um, and then you can continue to the next half hour where we'll, we'll strike the half hour. 
See, and so if I have to adjust the time forward, it's very easy. I just have to stop any time it's going to chime. You can go backwards, but you shouldn't go backwards past the 12, and you shouldn't go backwards past the 6. So you have, a, you have about a half hour range that you can go either direction, otherwise just go forward. And, uh, and you can also advance the strike by just lifting up on the, the wire here, and that will trigger the next hour sequence, uh, which in this case is 12. This is not good timing for this, by the way. Uh, but that's really all there is to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the uh, way you mount the clock is important. The biggest danger to these clocks is that they get knocked off the wall. And that's, I'm guessing, why there's two little broken pieces off the, uh, three actually, off the bottom of this clock, because it probably fell to the floor. And that is probably why the glass was broken as well. So what you want to do is place the clock away from a traffic area. You don't want it in a hallway. You don't want it near a doorway where it could be bumped into and, and potentially knocked off the wall. The best place is, um, you know, like above a fireplace or on a blank wall in your dining room or your kitchen that's out of the traffic lane. Um, and because it's a striking clock, you're not going to want this upstairs near the bedrooms because the, the chiming at night uh, is probably uh, too loud and it, and it might disrupt your sleep. So this is probably a clock best kept in a downstairs uh, main room. Because this is a family heirloom, it would be appropriate to put it in a prominent place and let it be a focal point. Um, this clock mounts on a single uh, nail or screw that you put in the wall and uh, it hangs so just on this. Now, because this screw only went into the quarter inch thick pine back on this clock, I added a strip of wood that I glued inside the case, it's kind of out of sight, and put a longer screw in here, so this is much more secure than it was originally. And I also added down here, I, I drove a small nail in and clipped the head off so it sticks out a, a tiny amount. And when you mount this on the wall, and you level it up, which on this clock is really easy because it's got a built-in level, and once the bubble is between the marks, right there, give it a little push, and that little nail is going to penetrate the wall and make a tiny hole, but it's going to keep the clock from shifting. Which is especially important when you, when you open the door and you wind it, it's easy for it to get uh, out of plumb. And if it's not plumb, the beat won't be even and it won't keep time correctly. So it's important that the clock stay plumb and because this one's got a, a level on it, that's easy to take care of. That's really all there is to care for it. I do want to point out one other thing on the back here I should have shown you before is this up here is the original label from the factory on there. I've created a facsimile of, of what the label probably looked like when it was new. It's not an exact perfect match, but it's pretty darn close. I tried to match fonts and the spacing and I was able to read all the words here and carefully retype it. So you've got a very close match to the original label on there which has instructions on how to care for the clock, by the way. And I also want to point out that this clock uh, has says Granberg uh, on the back, so uh, we know it belonged to the Granberg family its whole life, and, and they proudly put their name on it. So that's it. Um, I'm actually going to miss this clock. Uh, I've enjoyed having it uh, running here in my little downstairs uh, home office area for the past several weeks. It's been keeping good time. It's a happy clock. It likes to run, and I think it's a handsome clock, and I, I love that we know the family history of it. So that's the end of this, this story. I appreciate your, uh, your hanging with me. This is the first time I've made a video like this. Probably kind of boring, to be honest with you. Too long, but uh, there was a lot to share with you. So with that, I will uh, uh, bid you good, uh, good night. Thank you. Now, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, and that is, why do I do this? Why do I care? Uh, what interests me about these clocks that makes me want to spend hours fussing over them and adjusting them and tuning them? And it really comes down to several things. First of all, I like old things. I'm interested in mechanical things especially. Um, but what it really comes down to is... Um, the pursuit of mastery.
clocks take a long time to learn how to work on, to understand their intricacies, for them to really give up their secrets. And, uh, and so that pursuit of mastery is something that appeals to me. And I've worked on, I've been working on clocks for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that now. I've probably restored somewhere in the order of 50, 60 maybe of these things. A lot of them are in my own collection, but I've, I've done them for other people as well. And frankly, I don't need any more clocks. Uh, I have too many here, and so it's kind of fun to do them for other people. Um, and these clocks tell a really interesting story because these are kind of a miracle of the Industrial Revolution. Before the Industrial Revolution, clocks were a luxury item. They were for the, for the wealthy, and the common man couldn't afford a clock, generally speaking. Uh, and that was especially true in Europe, where the class hierarchy was much stronger and the clocks were not manufactured for the commoner, they were manufactured for a, uh, an elevated class of buyer. And in the U.S., however, the clock industry blossomed quickly. Most of the companies were in the Connecticut River Valley, in the state of Connecticut. And it was very competitive. The clocks were sold and marketed by catalog retailers like uh, Sears Roebuck and Company and Montgomery Ward and, uh, and were available in, all over the country and in, even in the territories that weren't states yet and, uh, and were shipped by railroad. And so we had a, a, a distribution network uh, much like the modern online economy but uh, based on catalogs and rail rather than online ordering. And so uh, the clocks uh, came down rapidly in price and were available to everybody. And this particular clock um, belonged originally to Otto Urson Granberg, who uh, was born in Sweden in 1858. He emigrated to the United States in 1882 as a 24-year-old. And uh, he made his way to the Minnesota area and settled. And, um, and eventually, uh, in 1915, when he was presumably about 57 years old, bought this clock. And what did that signify? That signified that he had made it. He was successful in the U.S. He was able to purchase what would have been a luxury item um, in other parts of the world. Uh, and it was a well-made, beautiful, functional uh, clock. The American manufacturing was the envy of the world at that time, and he was able to celebrate having established himself and become successful in the new world, uh, and showing the world that with the purchase of this clock. And uh, his son, Harold, was born in 1907, so Harold was about six years old when this clock was manufactured in December of 1914, uh, inherited this clock, and, and it has passed down from Harold to Donald, and now from Donald to Bertrand. And uh, so it stayed in the family. It's uh, on its fourth generation now, and presumably Bert will pass this on to his daughter, Macy, and, uh, and it will stay in the family. So I love that about this, um, and that's why I, I pursue this hobby. So hope that explains it. Thank you.